Okay, so in this video, we will prove, with the help of Taylor's theorem, that e to the x is equal to its Maclaurin series for all values of x. Now, we already know from the ratio test that this Maclaurin series converges for all values of x. What's not obvious is that it actually is equal to e to the x for all values of x. Well, let's see what Taylor's theorem gives us in this particular case. The center of the series, x0, is equal to 0, as we have a Maclaurin series. And the function f of x, of course, is e to the x. Well, the assumption is, if we want to apply Taylor's theorem, is that the function we're dealing with is infinitely differentiable around the center of the expansion. Well, this is the case, right? The derivative of e to the x is itself. So all higher derivatives of f at x are the same, namely e to the x. Well, since we're going to have the Taylor series centered at 0, we will be interested in the nth derivative of the function at 0. But for any choice of n, this is e to the 0, which is simply 1. So all the conditions are met. The function e to the x is infinitely differentiable around 0. All of its higher derivatives do exist, and they are quite simple. At the center, namely, they are all equal to 1. So, Taylor's theorem then states that f of x will be equal to the sum from 0 to uppercase n, where uppercase n is some positive integer. The terms, of course, are the higher derivatives of the function at 0 over n factorial, x minus 0, simply x to the n, plus, of course, the remainder term. Now, if you recall, we can visualize this onto the real line. x0 is the center of the expansion, and we will assume that x is positive. If x were negative, the argument would be exactly the same. So, the remainder, if you recall, is of the form the n plus 1 derivative, the first omitted term, at some point between the center of the expansion and the chosen value of x. We call this point x hat over n plus 1 factorial times x minus the center, but this is 0, so it's simply x to the n plus 1. This is what we call our n, the remainder term as a function of n. And now we can, of course, replace the nth derivative at 0 by 1, as it is always 1. And the nth plus 1 derivative of f is always e to the x, so this will be e to the x hat. And of course, this is valid for any positive integer n. And this is the statement of Taylor's theorem when we are in the special case where the center x0 is equal to 0. For any choice of positive integer n, we can find some value of x, namely x hat, between 0 and the value of x of interest, so that if we do evaluate the nth plus 1 derivative at this well-chosen value of x, the equality is valid. So now let's do two things. Let us replace the n plus 1 derivative at 0 by 1, and again the n plus 1 derivative by, in this case, e to the x hat, and we're going to also let uppercase n tend to infinity. Which will give us, well, f of x will remain f of x, which of course is e to the x. The corresponding series will be from 0 to infinity, as we're letting uppercase n tend to infinity. The nth derivative at 0 is 1, so we're going to have simply x to the n over n factorial. Plus, of course, well, the remainder term in the limit, what we hope is that the equality is valid, and this will be the case if we can show that the limit as n tends to infinity of our n, 
and again this will be e to the x hat x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial is equal to 0. And this is what we're after. So if we can show that this is equal to 0, as n tends to infinity, then the remainder term in the limit vanishes, and so the function e to the x will be equal to its Maclaurin series. And this is exactly what we were trying to show. Well, how do we show that this limit is equal to zero? Well, the first thing is that we have to be careful about e to the x hat, because x hat does depend on the value of n. Taylor's theorem says for any positive integer n, you can find some x hat between the center of the expansion and the value of x of interest, so that if we do evaluate the n plus 1 derivative at this value of x, x hat, the equality is valid. So we want to remove and then limit this dependence upon uppercase n. Well, if you notice, x hat is less than x, and as e to the x is an increasing function, therefore e to the x hat is less than e to the x. And now x does not depend on n, and so this inequality will allow us to remove the dependency upon uppercase n. This is, of course, the remainder And I will now take the absolute value of the remainder. So what we have is an absolute value, our n, will be less than, well, this term is less than, as we've just said, e to the x. Absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And now the key is that e to the x is a constant with respect to n, as x does not depend on n. So we can ignore this constant multiple of this sequence of n, and now if we can show that these terms do shrink to zero as n tends to infinity, well, any multiple of a sequence that converges to zero will also converge to zero. So let's call this sequence a n. And so how to show that this sequence will converge to zero as n tends to infinity? This is what we want to show. Now the argument we're going to use is very simple, but also a bit devious we will not show that the sequence a n converges to zero directly. Instead, we will find a very subtle argument for it. So let's consider the series of the corresponding sequence a n. So if we look at the series, as uppercase n goes from 1 to infinity of a n, well, this will be equal to replacing a n by its expression, namely an absolute value x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And the question we're going to look at is, does this series converge or diverge? Well, as we have a factorial, we can attack this series with the ratio test. So if we look at the limit, as n tends to infinity, of a n plus 1 over a n in absolute value. I will leave this up to you, but if you simplify this, what you're going to be left with is an absolute value x over n plus 2. Now x is some constant in absolute value, and as n tends to infinity, n plus 2 tends to infinity, so, a constant over something which blows up to infinity, of course, will shrink to zero. So, the limit coming from the ratio test is zero, which is strictly less than one. Therefore, this series 
A1 plus A2 plus A3 and so forth converges absolutely by the ratio test. And now you ask, well, what was the point of doing this? After all, we were trying to prove that as n tends to infinity, a n converges to zero. What we now have proved is that the corresponding series, a 1 plus a 2 plus a 3 plus a 4 and so forth, converges absolutely by the ratio test. How does that help us show that a n converges to zero? Well, this is a result we've proved really early on in our discussion of infinite series. If an infinite series converges, which here it does, then the terms we are summing have to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller, therefore they have to converge to zero. And because the series does converge by the ratio test, the terms we are summing must converge to zero as uppercase n tends to infinity. And again, this is a very intuitive result, right? Because think of what we're ultimately saying. This infinite series, if you expand, is nothing but a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4 and so on. And to say that the infinite series converges means that if we add this infinite set of terms, the result will be some real number. And of course, the only way intuitively to be able to add an infinite set of real numbers and the result to exist to return some real number is if the terms we're summing are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. How small will they have to be shrinking to zero? And so that's the intuition as to why when a, an infinite series converges, the terms we are summing over must shrink to zero. But then we're done. If you think about it, a n now does shrink to zero as n tends to infinity. We have just proved so. So a constant multiple of a sequence shrinking to zero will also shrink to zero. But in absolute value, our n was less than the sequence, which does shrink to zero, which means that in absolute value, our n must also shrink to zero. But if the absolute value of something shrinks to zero, the terms themselves must shrink to zero. And this completes the proof. We have just proved that the remainder term from Taylor's theorem in the special case where f of x is e to the x and the center was zero does converge to zero as we are letting n tend to infinity. So from the equality of Taylor's theorem, letting uppercase n tend to infinity the remainder term shrinks to zero, therefore goes away, and in the limit, f of x, namely e to the x, is exactly equal to the corresponding Maclaurin series. And that's it. So as an exercise, try and reproduce the same argument to prove that sine of x is equal to its Maclaurin series, and cos of x is equal to its Maclaurin series also. And you will find that you can pretty much just copy paste this argument and it will work in the exact same way. So our conclusion is that in the past we have claimed that e to the x was equal to its Maclaurin series for all values of x and now we have proved this claim using Taylor's theorem. And that's it.